So good evening. My name is Robin Constantopoulos. I'm the owner and operator of Autism Unplugged Learning Center in Keswick. Uh, we're just about an hour north of Toronto, for those of you that don't know. We uh, specialize in ABA, which is Applied Behavior Analysis or Behavior Modification. We also do assessments and diagnosis of autism, ADHD, PDD, NOS. Uh, we have a PhD level psychologist. We've got a BCBA, an Ontario certified school teacher. Um, so we are, we're very uh, all encompassing um, in our way of treating autism. We like to take a holistic approach, meaning not just uh, at the table drilling children. What we want is play based and also looking at the whole child. And what we mean by that is looking at what they're eating, how they're sleeping, even maybe how they're going to the washroom. I know that might sound like something uh, a little bit funny to hear, but you'll hear more about that later on. Um, so one of the most important things that I think that is important to me for you to know is that I am the mother of two autistic children, one very high functioning or highly verbal, we call it, and one that is very severe, uh, was uh, diagnosed with level three autism, nonverbal, uh, significant behaviors. And it wasn't until we found someone, uh, we stumbled on Dr. Doherty, who's gonna be visiting with us this evening, um, that we learned how, how food and how diet and how um, what we're putting into our children's bodies was significantly affecting my son and his behaviors and my daughter and her behaviors. Um, and now fast forward 12 years, my son is doing long division and multiplication and reading comprehension and is speaking full sentences um, and is doing incredibly well um, despite all the odds that were given against us. And I truly believe that a lot to do with that um, has to do uh, with the treatment that we received from Dr. Sonia Doherty at the Natural Care Clinic. So Dr. Doherty um, has been practicing as a naturopath uh, since 2003, I'm just going to read this off nicely. Uh, <laughs> uh, so she completed her pre-med at uh, University of Western Water Waterloo, uh, postgraduate natu naturopathic training at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. Um, she is trained as a DAN doctor, which specializes in the treatment of autism and neurological and uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and uh, training uh, with the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs with FMAPS. Dr. Sonia, I hope I got all of that right. Um, <laughs> it's quite a mouthful, um, but more to, your, uh, more to your credit, I think, is what we've seen in the families, especially at our center that have gone through treatment with you, um, and, and kudos to you for that. So with that, I will put, uh, I'll just gonna flip this over to you and, uh, and we'll spotlight for uh, for everyone. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you, um, Robin. Thanks so much to you and Autism Unplugged for having me out tonight to chat. And um, you know, we've we've done events before, and I think you have been so helpful in spreading the word about how biomedical treatment and diet can help to improve the lives of children diagnosed with autism. So. Um, yeah, I've, I've been practicing a fair, fair amount. This is my 18th year then, and I've spent the majority of those years focused on biomedical treatment of autism. Um, I was referred a patient very early on in my career, um, who had, was diagnosed with autism. And I, I realized that through my naturopathic training, I, I didn't learn a lot about autism. Um, so I went to the Autism Research Institute. I familiarized myself with as much as I possibly could uh, related to autism. And immediately I went to train um, with Dan and then a group of doctors created the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs. And so, you know, to their credit, they continue to train doctors from around the world. And these underlying medical concerns in autism, I think are so important to be part of our conversations with families. Uh, hopefully by the end of our chat, you'll you'll have a good understanding of why methylation is important. And, and so I'm gonna dive in. I do have a PowerPoint here. Hopefully I can share my screen. Um, Robin, you may you have mind. to make you a co-host. Just give me a quick second, Dr. Yeah, absolutely. So 
methylation is a cycle in our bodies. It's a biochemical cycle. And one of the easiest ways to understand methylation is that uh, from two parents, there's two reproductive My apologies. I'll run those together later for the recording. It's amazing. I knew you'd be able to. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh oh. <laughs> um, so I I like to explain methylation like this. Like, so two cells from mom and dad combine, and through the process of methylation, they become a human baby. So methylation is involved in everything from making neurons to making all of the hundreds of trillions of cells in our body. Uh, methylation makes brain chemicals like serotonin and dopamine. Uh, methylation is really important for repair. So if there is damage to the body through toxicity or nutrient deficiencies, inflammation, the mechanism of repair is our methylation cycle. So it is critical. Um, it helps to provide energy to the brain to function. And so when these brilliant researchers started to sort of look at the medical aspects of autism, um, they looked at this cycle and they actually found that 90% of children, I'm just going to move us down here, 90% of children, or maybe up here, I don't know where this best, Robin, but 90% of children diagnosed with autism have a problem with the methylation cycle. So what I have shown you here is a pink wheel and a green wheel. And this pink wheel represents the folate cycle. So the folate cycle, you know, many of you probably know folate is really important for development. That's why we're recommended to take folate uh, during pregnancy and during breastfeeding. So folic acid gets converted through this cycle. And then one of these um, sort of methyl donors will then give the donor to the green cycle. This is a lot like a bicycle. So in order for your bicycle to properly work, to move forward, which is a good analogy for development, you need to have both of these wheels working. So one of the reasons diet is both so important and so powerful as a treatment is that in most places that I know, certainly in Canada and in the United States, we synthetically fortify our grains with folic acid. So there is synthetic folic acid in every grain that we eat from bread to cookies, to crackers, to cereal, to rice, they put folic acid into our grains. And that folic acid has to be converted many, many, many times through this cycle in order to allow this green wheel or the other wheel of the bicycle to work. So just to give you some numbers, when you're pregnant, the recommendation is that you take 400 micrograms, just 0.4 milligrams. The average Canadian child with autism or person has 5,000 micrograms of synthetic folic acid daily in their diet, or five milligrams. So if you can't convert that, that is gonna slow and clog up this system. You're gonna slow and clog up this system. And then downstream, we can't repair cells. We have less energy production. Kids can't produce as much serotonin and dopamine. The brain starts to get overstimulated and excited and overwhelmed. You can't get rid of inflammation. You also can't get fat into the cell the same way other children can. And fat is critical to, to development because it provides the energy the brain needs to function. So if you are eating a typical diet and you have problems with conversion, all of a sudden your methylation cycle is slowing 200 other cycles in the body. So one of the most common genes that people talk about in autism is MTHFR. That's this one right here. So MTHFR stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. It converts folic acid into methylfolate. And methylfolate is just fuel for the brain. I call it gold for the brain. If kids can't get very easily to this step, they're going to have a lot of downstream weaknesses, a lot of problems. Think of something as simple as tone, right? Uh, this cycle makes creatine, uh, creatine. And creatine is what puts energy into our muscles. That's why bodybuilders use it, to get big muscles. Well, creatine is needed for development. So a lot of these kids who have low tone, low energy, they, they have that because of the methylation cycle. And it's certainly not the only reason, but that's just one good example. So 
in the world of autism, through research, um, one of the, the researchers in this department is uh, Jill James, who's a PhD biochemist. She studied this when she was at the Arkansas Children's Research Institute. And she figured out that 90% of children diagnosed with autism have problems with methylation. So 90% of them are going to have some or all of the problems that I just discussed. She also then went further and looked at the families of children diagnosed with autism and their parents and their grandparents also showed methylation weakness. So it doesn't have to be a genetic issue. And keep in mind, this is not genetic um, like Down syndrome. Down syndrome is when there is an extra chromosome. So we get, you know, 23 chromosomes from mom and dad, and it sort of looks like a big H. And then on those chromosomes, I don't know if you guys can see that, but on those chromosomes are thousands of genes. So MTHFR would be one of those genes. This is not a chromosomal problem. This is not a genetic disorder in the way that we currently understand it. It's different genes that are having trouble functioning at their optimal. These are often called SNPs. So single nucleotide polymorphisms, it means a gene uh, or an enzyme that's not working properly. The job of MTHFR is to move folate from a synthetic form into active folate. Or if it comes in through something like spinach or lentils, that's much easier to convert. And that's why the diet is so powerful. One of the last things I want to mention about the folate, folate cycle is that the body preferentially binds synthetic folic acid. So basically, if you need to get active folate into the brain, you have to wait till all the synthetic folic acid has been metabolized. And if you have impaired metabolism, you have a bunch of crappy folate your child can't use in the synthetic form, slowing down brain function. So I might come back and, and put a few more pieces in there, but I want to move on to the green wheel just for context. So this green wheel runs on B12. MTR, MTRR, these are other genes or SNPs. Lots of people with autism have problems with these as well. Um, these genes or enzymes slow down with toxicity. So things like lead, pesticides, overgrowth of yeast or candida in the intestine, all of which have been linked to autism. So you can have a problem with the gene or you can have a problem with a toxin that is causing um, the gene to work not as effectively. And the example I give when it comes to these SNPs or these genes is like a bridge. So if you have a beautiful Skyway bridge, it's got lots of lanes, you know, it's moving lots of traffic very effectively. That's a lot like if you have an MTHFR SNP that can take folic acid and quickly make active folate. If you had like a lift bridge, it's going to be a much slower process and it's easier to get clogged up. You're going to get traffic jams. Uh, you're not going to be able to make as much of the downstream product as you need. So just keep in mind that genes actually have an action in our methylation cycle. They have a role to play. They have a job to do. And when they're, they're not doing their job properly, there are going to be problems in up to 200 pathways in the body. So one of the interesting things they looked at after they sort of identified that methylation was a problem is they, they said, well, methylation runs on B12. What would happen if we actually inject children with B12? And they saw improvements. Improvements in communication, both nonverbal and um, expressive, reduction in behavior, improvement in social interaction, um, and improved cognitive or academic performance. So this makes sense if you just look at this as a straight fueling problem. If, if the body's not getting enough fuel, the brain is tired. When the brain is tired, the brain becomes inflamed. And we know that when there has been research on brain tissue in autism, not to be gruesome, but when people have passed away and those brains have then been looked at, there's very, very low B12 in their brain. So methylation is critical to biomedical treatment. Um, and diet is so important because if this pink wheel is not moving, you're eating grains, um, then even B12 can only at best spin this green wheel. Um, so it's really important to put the two supports in uh, together if possible, but the most powerful support really is unlocking the slowness of the pink wheel. The other thing that happens with grains, and, and again, this is North America, this is probably throughout most of the world, is that grains like rice and um, wheat and amaranth and, and millet, you know, any of these complex carbohydrates, when they are... Um, stored, they're stored in, in a propionic acid, which is a preser preservative. 
So the propionic acid is important because you can't have moldy grains. You can't have the grains grow mold on them because that mold is very dangerous. But the propionic acid itself is completely unregulated. They don't know how much they're using in agriculture. They're not told to stick to a certain amount. It's not tested to see if it's still in food when our kids are eating it. And it has been linked to autism. So if you Google PPA, propionic acid, autism, you'll see that the research is really starting to build. And one of those researchers is from Canada, and he's in London, Ontario. Uh, I'd love to do a whole session. Maybe we'll do one of the, the next webinars on gut and brain, and we'll talk about Dr. McFabe. But he basically showed that the propionic acid reduces B12, it impairs methylation, and it leads to um, inflammation in the brain and all kinds of other downstream, pro downstream problems that he proved. He proved it in an animal model where the brains became inflamed, they were starving for fat, they were deficient in many of the things that the methylation cycle makes. So that's reason number two. We've got the folic acid that's synthetic in the grains. We've got the propionic acid that depletes B12 on a very, very large scale. And then the last one is if there are microbes in the gut that are opportunistic um, or probably troublemakers, uh, things like yeast or clostridia, strep, the grains are going to feed those. So then you're getting even worse um, problems in the gut, and then that will cause problems in the brain. Is it yeah. So those are the three big reasons that we need to sort of unlock the the green wheel. And one of the big questions I get, because I talk to the families that I work with about this um, in, in the first few steps of treatment. And one of the first questions I'll get is, well, but my child's a picky eater. Keep in mind that one of the things that happens when the methylation cycle is impaired is that the brain really, really changes. And the brain changes so much so, let's see if I can, there we go. I'll send you this, uh, I'm going to work off this for the next, um, like today and the next two webinars that we have. Um, but essentially, there, you know, this is giving an overview of the really, really important roles that the, the methylation cycle plays. The big thing as it relates to the, the symptoms that you can see in autism and the addiction to carbohydrates or the addiction to junk food or dairy, juice, cookies, um, is this right here. B12 through the methylation cycle makes glutathione. And glutathione is the body's master antioxidant. It's actually called that. I know it sounds silly, but it's the body's master antioxidant and it governs brain function. So if you don't have enough glutathione, then your brain is actually going to start to build glutamate. And glutamate is the most plentiful brain chemical. It helps to make the brain of our babies when we're pregnant and through the first two, three years of their life. Glutamate is really important, but it is an excitable neurotransmitter. So if it gets to a point where it's too high, it, it actually causes OCD, fixations, tics, sensory issues. Uh, sleeping problems, uh, stimming. This is the root of many, many, many autistic behaviors. The glutamate in the brain has been found to be elevated in autism and research. And one of the biggest reasons why is going to be that methylation cycle. So as soon as you take out grains, your body will make more glutathione. And as soon as you make more glutathione, the brain can get the glutamate reduced. And, and most parents would report they see significant gains. So let's circle back to this addiction piece. And I don't use that word lightly. Um, some of you may already kind of be somewhat resonating with that term because a lot of kids, they can't live without the carbs. They, they act like they, they won't eat anything else. They, they're picky eaters or they're restricted feeders. But I honestly, after 18 years, I think the majority of the children are just straight up carbohydrate addicts. And that is not a casual term keeping in mind that sugar and complex carbohydrates can be uh, eight times as addictive as cocaine for the brain, particularly when you have too much glutamate. So every time you eat rice, cookie, bread, crackers, your glutamate spikes, then it drops. So does your dopamine and serotonin. So in, in some ways, I think kids with autism, and we do see it in other neurodevelopmental concerns, you also see it in depression, um, they're boosting their brain with the carbs, but it's so short term that they don't maintain it. And then it drops again. And then they want that hit again. And then it drops again. 
and they want that hit again. And that's the, the root of addiction. The microbes that live in their gut, say like yeast, um, if they are fed carbohydrates, they actually make aldehydes, which are indistinguishable from alcohol. So an aldehyde acts exactly like alcohol in the brain. So when our kids are eating, their intestines, the microbes that live in there are making a drug-like effect um, or, or an alcohol-like effect, and they become very addicted to the foods they're eating. They also have a brain that hurts. Um, you know, one of the adults that we work with who has autism says often it feels like her brain is squeezing itself. Um, I know she said that when she eats, it feels like a freight train going through her intestines. Um, these are folks that have, uh, you know, as I'm sure you know, sensory pain, they can be self-injurious, they can be aggressive, their body is hurting, and grains are a way that they self-medicate. So is dairy. You have those kids and they won't eat anything but cheese or drink milk. These are addictive behaviors. And so when it comes to the diet, the way to treat addiction is cold turkey. And it took me a little while to learn this in practice, but you can safely and medically transition children onto this diet in three days. So, you know, a diet without grains and dairy looks like meat, vegetables, fruit, nuts, seeds, and eggs. And some of you might be saying, well, my child won't eat that. Well, I'll tell you that the human physiology is quite predictable. Um, and so is human biochemistry. So if you, if you take a child off their typical food, and wait them out for three days, first of all, you're not gonna kill them in three days. You can't starve someone in three days. And I say that because I'm a parent and I wanna know what are the safety risks of me doing this. Um, we have three different levels of consciousness as humans, right? So one, we're talking, you know I'm talking, I know you guys are here hanging out with me. That's a conscious, uh, active brain um, recognition. If something bursts through my door, um, I would go into fight or flight mode. That's mammalian. I wouldn't have control over that. That's part of the brain that takes over when it's under threat. Underneath both of those two layers of consciousness is the survival brain. And sometimes it's called the reptilian brain, but I'm not really thrilled with it. I'm not a big reptile fan. So survival brain. And that's the brain we're relying on to ensure that children transition onto the foods that are healing their brain rather than hurting their brain. And although it can be emotionally hard and very stressful, it's extremely successful because your children can't go. Most of them can't go grocery shopping. Most of them aren't making food and they only have access to the drug if you give it to them. And just like if you had someone who was addicted to heroin or cocaine or some other drug, they could go to rehab and in a very short period of time, they would be detoxified and they would be almost a different person. Now, the problem with adults is they come out of rehab and then they, they find their drug again. Actually, most percent of the time because uh, addiction centers, I think, are about 3% successful. But we as parents can be 100% successful because we are the only ones who can give these foods to our children. Um, a lot of what I do, I, I sort of think it's compassionate coaching. Um, if these foods, no, not if, these foods are causing pain, they are causing brain inflammation, they are contributing to many, if not all of the behaviors, and they're slowing down children's progression towards you know, meeting, meeting their, their goals in therapy, whether they're, they're social or learning or communication. So just imagine that, you know, because we're Canadian, just imagine you get in your car on a, on a winter morning and your windshield's covered in ice and snow. You can't go anywhere. You can't get anything done until that's cleared away. That's the food that's coming into your child's body. It's not your fault and it's not their fault, but it is transformative to treat it. So I'm going to give you guys some resources, but I will mention them here. There, there is an amazing book called The Autism Revolution written by Dr. Martha Herbert. Uh, Dr. Herbert is a pediatric neurologist from Harvard. She's a really brilliant lady, and she wrote a whole book about how diet can transform the lives of children with autism, people with autism, pardon me. Um, there is you know, Grain Brain, which talks about the brain in general, certainly does touch on autism, but that book's by David Perlmutter, also a neurologist. Um, there's a lovely book called Healing Our Autistic Children. Um, this is by Julie Buckley. Julie Buckley, Dr. Julie Buckley, is a pediatrician down in Jacksonville, and I consider her my mentor. I learn more from Dr. Buckley than I learn from anyone on autism treatment. And what she says, which I love, is I tell parents, 
diet's not hard, autism is hard. Um, these foods also contribute to seizures. So, you know, diet's not hard, seizures are hard. So we need to take a leadership role in our kids' lives and at least give it a shot. And, and I'm not pretending it's easy, but if you are looking at this biochemistry, hopefully it's making a lot of sense, right? And, and I'm gonna go back here and sort of just say, if this opens up 200 doors in your child's development, all you need to do is take that leap of faith. And if they don't eat anything for three days, you may have a child who's in a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percentage of the population. It just doesn't happen. Between meat, vegetables, fruit, nuts, seeds, and eggs, obviously not anything anaphylactic. I'm not recommending to eat foods that children are anaphylactic to. Um, a kid can eat 12 eggs a day. Um, I have a young man that I worked with a long time ago, and he ate bacon, pistachios, and raisins. That's all he ate for like a year. Started playing with his sister, started talking, uh, showed his parents how much he knew at school, because I'm sure as Robin can tell you, our kids are really, really smart. They just have a lot of medical concerns that are not being addressed. So um, I do have, you know, again, this is, this is stuff that you may want to dig deeper into. Some people are pretty happy just to kind of take a, a look at the overview. And then I really like the visuals. Um, this term here, immunoexcitotoxicity, really neat um, neurologist. His name is Russell Blaylock. He proposed this central mechanism for autism, for PTSD, for um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, you know, the head trauma that the football players get. And he said, it's all about immunoexcitotoxicity. So this is a giant word, but it just explains it all. So basically, our brain is 85% immune system. Believe it or not, you think it's neurons? It's only 15% neurons. The rest of the brain is an immune system. And if it's stressed out, it turns on. So immuno, immune, excito, excited, turns on. And then if it turns on too much, it pumps out too much glutamate, it becomes toxic. And that is where a lot of these symptoms are coming from. Uh, we talk about inflammation, we talk about oxidative stress, we talk about massive nutrient deficiencies. Um, these brains are starving for fuel. That's healthy fat, that's vitamins like B12, it's vitamins like B6. Um, and once you pull, well, once you transition a child onto this diet that some people call paleo, some people call modified ketogenic, some people call South Beach, some people <laughs> call it everything. Take out the grains, take out the dairy, right? We don't, we don't need a special name for it. These are foods that do not work for the autistic population. And, um, you know, they're not the only population these foods don't work for. Often they don't work for people with diabetes. They can impair fertility, these foods. There are cancers that do phenomenal on, on the paleo or modified ketogenic diet. Um, so dietary intervention is powerful. And again, I'll go back to just a little bit of math is that one teaspoon of grains or complex carbohydrates, say, you know, something like bread. So one teaspoon of grains actually causes this amino toxicity for five hours. So if you eat two pieces of bread, that's six full teaspoons, that's 30 hours of the brain being overwhelmed. So that, that, that's your child's day uh, and then it builds on itself, unfortunately, like a fire that gets way, way, way out of control. So this dietary intervention will decrease the glutamate, decrease the immunoexcitotoxicity. And, and interestingly enough, is the more we find about the research in autism, the more we go back and say, yeah, this, this diet can help that too. It helps if you've heard the microbiome, it helps mitochondria. And if you haven't, we're going to jump into that stuff in the next couple of weeks. Our biochemistry is pretty complex. And in this little section here, this would rep represent the pink wheel. This would represent the green wheel. This down here is the production of glutathione, which I think I'm in the way of myself here, but um, we'll move us again. There we go. Maybe. Okay. Right underneath here, here we go. There is glutathione. Um, over here is serotonin and dopamine. So remember how I talked about the methylation cycle and how important it is for brain function. Your child needs serotonin for uh, learning, uh, noise processing, sleep, mood, appetite, um, memory, 
uh, your child needs dopamine because it is base cognitive function. It's focus, attending, processing information, integrating sensory information. Um, and when I do tests on serotonin and dopamine and autism, 99% of the time they're low. And it makes sense because if this wheel is slow and this wheel is slow, then all the downstream wheels become even slower. This here is the Krebs cycle, if you guys remember. Um, I think the, we start kind of learning about the Krebs cycle in, in biology. I don't know if it's grade seven, eight, nine, very cursory, but basically this cycle makes all the energy in the body. And this cycle is a problem in autism. Children with autism have impaired energy production, right? That's why we see they have slower development. They have slower language. They have slower eye contact. Um, sometimes they even have delayed motor skills, but not always. And, and so this is really just all, like a, a very small snapshot of our biochemistry. But the, the fascinating thing about biochemistry is it's like a roadmap. It's very, very consistent and you can improve it in every single person in the world. It's just that if you have these exposures in here, mercury lead, you have low B12. And if you look really close, you can see all of the um, supports that are needed to make the methylation cycle work properly. Up here is worth mentioning as well. If this is the pink cycle, what, the pink cycle also helps to repair our DNA. So when we use our genetic material, if there's damage to it, then the products that we make are not as good, right? Because keep in mind that our genes are constantly working to make things. And if our genes are tired and damaged, the products they make are not as good. They're also more easily damaged. So... You know, Robin's very tech savvy. I am not. So that's about as fancy as it gets. Um, but this is speaking to the immunoexcitotoxicity, the glutathione depletion. And this is all something that you can start to reverse by pulling out the grains. So I, it's quite fascinating. I mean, I don't, I talk about this almost every day. I do get the opportunity to lecture on methylation a fair amount. And it still blows my mind how elegant this system is and how easily clogged up it is by the, the North American diet. So I'm going to get out of here for a second. And let's see here. I wanted to show you this little guy. He's called a, a, a homunculus. And I don't know if you've ever seen a homunculus before, but a homunculus is a visual representation of where the body's energy is allocated. So mitochondria make all the energy within our body and we need that energy to do everything everything from visual processing to eye contact to talking um, to pointing um, you know to join attention all of it, it depends on how much energy our mitochondria can make mitochondria are the energy production factories in your cells so nothing in your body happens without mitochondria even digestion um, when the brain uh, is is doing things when the brain is learning when the brain is is retrieving information when the brain is connecting with the mouth to make words it all needs atp that's like currency everything we do needs money and the the money in the body is is the atp so research has shown that in autism there are problems with the mitochondria there is less energy production part of that is because the methylation cycle is supposed to allow the mitochondria to make energy so what we get is actually quite a predictable downstream weakness. So this homunculus, so visually here, this guy is showing us where in our body takes or needs the most energy. So the lips and the tongue, the eyes and the hands. And so if you have a child with autism, you probably, these are where they are delayed. Sometimes they even have delays within the body with their gross motor skills, but the eyes, and the mouth are the finest fine motor skills that we have. We have all kinds of little muscles, hundreds of little teeny tiny muscles that have to coordinate and they have to fire at the right time. This is motor planning. So while we don't think about our motor planning, it's quite easy for most of us to point at something and then look at someone and draw their attention. It, it's easy for us to say words and sentences, but without enough energy, uh, children with autism can't motor plan properly. And so that's partly why their therapies are so based in repetitive activities. It's retraining the brain and the eyes, the brain and the mouth, 
and then retraining the brain itself to connect um, to the different aspects that are required for cognitive performance. I would argue a lot of our kids uh, are way more capable than we can see when they have impaired motor planning. It's really quite phenomenal, the changes you can see once you start improving energy production inside a little person. And, and energy production is not hard, actually, to accomplish. We see this in elite athletes all the time. Elite athletes use mitochondrial medicine to enhance their performance, not with steroids, not in an illegal way. They use diet, they use B12 injections, they use uh, B12 injections actually improve uh, endurance in, in many, many sports. So they're using it for their body performance, for their sport. Um, we use the same approach for children's brain and their brain performance, their body's performance as it relates to eye contact and communication. Um, but the mitochondria need a certain set of circumstances to thrive. So one is the paleo diet. Um, it, that's related to methylation, but also even separately than that, research has shown that if you put your child on a paleo diet, it will improve mitochondrial production of the energy molecule. So that's the ATP. And then keep in mind that methylation actually makes the cell membrane. So if we want this whole system to work, we need to provide enough fuel. We need to unlock you know, the, the brakes essentially that are on the methylation cycle. That's why I, I imagine it like a bike, um, you know, because the bike that we want to move forward at a proper speed has brakes on it. And the brakes are not enough B12 and, and the grains that are really causing that pink wheel to slow, to slow way, way down. So this is one of the last things I kind of want to talk specifically about methylation. Um, this, this is, this is biochemistry, right? So it's like, well, where would you start? You start with methylation. Methylation is the cycle that governs development. It's responsible for brain chemicals, uh, both increasing the good stuff, reducing the problematic brain chemicals. Like I said, it repairs, it makes cells, it allows fat to get into the cell so that the mitochondria can produce energy. This methylation really is critical to um, the, the, the medical treatment of autism. I mean, we, we call it biomedical. Biomedical simply sort of speaks to the individualization of assessing people with different concerns, right? So the biomedical treatment looks at all these different aspects of, say, a child with autism and then puts in place treatments. Uh, but with 90% of kids having the methylation issues, it's, it's really the best place to start. Um, and in, after the research in methylation started with Jill James, one of the doctors who first injected in fact, I think he is the first doctor who first, you know, injected a child with B12. Um, he <laughs> tells this story where he had a child come into, come into his office. They recommended B12 injections with a little tiny insulin syringe. And um, then, you know, the, the kid went on his way. They, he talks about this being sort of the, the uh, front lines of autism treatment where they were trying all kinds of different things, but they weren't sure what was going to work. As long as it was safe, they would try it. So Dr. Newbrander tells the story. So he injected his first kid diagnosed with autism with B12. Parents came back a few weeks later, so excited at the changes. Um, and that continues to be the case when we look at supporting methylation. Um, so I think I'm just going to pause here. I'm not sure how many questions uh, we might have, Robin, or if you think I've maybe missed anything you want me to touch base on. And I apologize because when I gave you the host... Um, I lost the ability to see what anything that might have come up. Um, so if, if people have questions, now's a great time to throw them in the chat. I don't know if you see anything there. Um, Sonia. What I if my daughter has, can I read this out here? It says, yeah. what if my daughter has high B12 in her blood work? Just an uptake issue, pathway issue. I have homogenous MTHFR polymorphism. So it, B12 in the blood is really, um, it's, it doesn't tell us anything. So unfortunately, when there's B12 in the blood, it can be pseudo B12 from the microbes in the gut. It can be a trapping issue. You could have a problem with the folate. You have too much synthetic folic acid, and now the B12 can't get into the cell. But we typically ignore the B12 level in the blood. Um, there is a great, I'll send, I'm going to make a resource, um, 
list here. Dr. Sears has a book called The Autism Book. Um, and on page 256, he, he sort of starts to talk about B12. And, and he goes through the reasons why that the blood levels of B12 really are not, they're not accurate and they are not important in terms of guiding treatment. They recommend a trial of B12, so four to five weeks. Um, if you do that when a child's on a grain-free diet, most of those kids will improve in some way. Some of them dramatically, some of them, you know, even small improvements, as you know, as parents, we rejoice in. So, you know, we're, we're not saying that B12 is going to cure and all these, you know, types of things that get really confusing. When we're talking about treating autism, we're talking about treating the medical aspects of autism. Again, I'll use the example of Down syndrome. P children and adults with Down syndrome are more at risk for things like thyroid problems and, and you know, um, diabetes, metabolic issues, dementia. So we don't just say, oh, well, you have Down syndrome. So because of neurodiversity, we're going to accept your medical issues, right? So in autism, we really need to get this information out there. We need to know, we need parents to know that with autism comes medical issues mm -hmm. and those medical issues really need to be treated because when the glutamate gets so high that kids are stimming constantly, they're banging their heads on the wall, they're, you know, they might have tics, they're fixated, they're, they're stuck in routines. All of this is because glutamate cannot run the brain. It's a wonderful brain chemical that cannot be in charge of the brain. And, you know, we see that at the center quite frequently. Um, kids that come in first thing in the morning and they've got real dark black circles. And we'll say, you know, what did they have for breakfast? Oh, well, they had a bagel on the way to on, on the way to the center this morning. And it's like, okay, that makes sense. Or they'll go have lunch and come back. And then all of a sudden we'll see the dark circles or we'll see the behavior spike um, significantly after they've had, um, you know, their snack or their, um, or, or their lunch or whatever it is. But we, we see that very, very frequently where they'll be going along quite nicely and then they'll have the snack and then everything just crashes. Yeah, food, food is incredible. I had a parent not too long ago, maybe two, three weeks ago, and, and they said we had no idea the food we were giving our child was causing these behaviors. And, and again, treatment, any type of treatment takes time. And, and it's a process, but I don't know very, I can't even think of a kid who went on this diet and didn't improve like even a little bit. And sometimes it's dramatic. Sometimes it's, it's your behavior is way, way, way down. Now there's other aspects to downstream issues that we see once the mitochondria have become so weak. And then once the um, methylation cycle slows down all those other cycles, we do see a slowdown in the gut. That's actually quite unique to autism. Well, actually I shouldn't say that because you see it in cystic fibrosis. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with cystic fibrosis, but um, and it's not an area of expertise for me, but they don't clear the mucus from their lungs. They also don't clear the mucus from their intestines. So their intestines become stuck with old, sticky, gooey, mucusy stool, and it gets really, really hard. It stops their absorption of nutrients. So kids with CF are put on a diet that's 50% healthy fat. They are also given really high dose vitamins because they can't absorb anything. So in cystic fibrosis, they also have higher rates of autism which is why I find this paper just literally just life-changing like this. I mean, I wouldn't do it because it's probably super inappropriate, but I just love to run and give this man a big hug, Tim Bowie, Dr. Tim Bowie um, and his team. Give me one sec here. They put together this list of symptoms that they relate right back to the gut. I'm going to do a better job so you can see them. I just, uh, he's finicky. There we go. So once your mitochondria and your methylation stops working properly, your intestines become really sluggish. And keep in mind that parts of our intestines have to go fight gravity, right? They have to bring poop up pipes, across pipes, around pipes. This is a system that requires a tremendous amount of energy. And it's driven by the methylation cycle and the mitochondrial production of ATP. So just like the eyes and the mouth and the hands, the intestines are many, many feet long. So you know, like six to 15 feet long. Obviously the younger you are, the shorter they are. And once the slowdown hits the gut, you start seeing these symptoms. And so once in a while you'll get kids where they, yeah, I don't know if you guys wanna. So frequent clearing of the throat, uh, ticks, 
And this even is accurate for kids with Tourette's, which is quite interesting. These kids scream for no reason. They do this uh, verbal stim. I won't do it too loud, but they go, Yee! that's, this is something slowed down somewhere in the gut. They cry for no reason. Like sometimes we know um, what might be triggering them. Sometimes they seem like they're crying for no reason. They grind their teeth like crazy. Um, they look like they're in pain. They can whinge and wince. Um, they do a lot of grunting and moaning and groaning. They, they constantly want to eat. And they constantly want to like put stuff in their mouth, chew on things. Sometimes they actually press their belly into a table or like over the top of a couch, or they lean into your legs really hard to apply pressure to their, their abdomen. Um, sometimes what you'll get is a behavior that parents, understandably, they can find quite concerning and upsetting is they, it's a preoccupation with the private parts. And they're just kind of trying to drive that area into like a pillow or something like a surface that's firmer and parents will say like you know they're they're constantly in that area but it's like it has nothing to do typically with their private parts their stomach is so filled with old stool it's pressing in that same area so we get that one and it, you know parents will sometimes wait till the end of the call and they'll say okay my kid does this all the time I'm like thanks for telling me because that's so treatable right this child is uncomfortable they're not doing this um you know people will think it's it's like they've found their private area and that's why they're doing it that's a whole separate thing that has nothing to do with this particular behavior. The rubbing of the abdomen and that area is to relieve discomfort. Um, they do a lot of tapping. I don't know how these doctors figured this out. It blows my mind. They tap on themselves. They tap on other people. They tap on stuff. I've seen this get better once you treat it. Mm -hmm. um, they do a lot of strange stimming. You know, they do a lot of like bending forward, stimming with their arms going backwards, self-injury, um, down at the bottom, it's self-injury, aggression. They run back and forth constantly. They jump up and down, run back and forth, run back and forth, jump up and down. And, and sometimes this is all day long. And, and this is all, these are all medical. And this is, I'm a naturopath. I understand, you know, we're still working as a profession to get it closer and closer to mainstream. And I'm going to show you the list of doctors who put this together. These are, this guy is a pediatric gastroenterologist at Boston Children's. He's saying, he's imploring people. He's saying, behaviors that may be markers of abdominal pain or discomfort in individuals with autism present this way. So Dr. Sonia, can you share with us again, which book that is? This is a paper by Tim Bowie, which I'll put in our resource section. I don't know why it does this. It doesn't do this when I'm like not on Zoom. So I'm always like trying to maneuver, but this is the list of docs. Um, here's Tim Bowie right at the front where he belongs. Amazing. Fantastic. Uh, we have three questions here, and I'm just being cognizant of time. So Good. we have yeah. um, the first question is how B12 is administered for treatment of autism. Why do doctors not prescribe B12 in general, but rather ask parents to go for ABA, OT, et cetera? Well, I think as great as this research is, it's newer. So it takes trickle time. It takes time. I mean, we we took 50 years to put folic acid into the grains mm -hmm. and, and now we're seeing that it wasn't a great idea. So medicine is not something that shifts easily. And I think a lot of doctors can be not in a, in a critical way, but I think that they can be quite intimidated by these behaviors. Mm -hmm. I had a mom today and she said, the doctor doesn't want her bringing her son to the office because he's big and he's, he's, he paces and he's intense. And so the doctor herself, like you, the mom said, she just, he does, she doesn't feel comfortable with my son there. You know, the, the behavior can, and as you guys know, it can be so intense that we're just, it's hard for us to think, wow, this could be medical and it's not all medical, but there are parts that are medical. And then we need to really work together as these types of holistic teams, as Robin said, um, to, to make sure we're treating the medical aspects. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next question. Can we talk about gut health and how gut flora microbiome can also be improved? Well, a wonderful question. So Derek McFabe is the hero in this story. And Dr. McFabe basically is the one who showed that propionic acid that's made by microbes can cause brain inflammation and the methylation <clears throat> problems. And, and that could be from the grains with propionic acid, or it be, can become, it can come from the microbes that live in the gut. And so these grains, they live and, and thrive when you feed them carbohydrates. And when you actually take the carbohydrates out, which Derek did in his research, Dr. McFabe, 
he actually showed that you could reverse the brain inflammation by taking out the complex carbohydrates. And his research was so phenomenal that Canada awarded him a top 50 findings in Canadian history. In 2015, he spoke at the Nobel Laureate Conference on his research that basically showed if you take the complex carbohydrates out, the brain will start to repair itself. So he had animal model where the animals had typical brains. He put in the propionic acid from the microbe, Clostridia, which is a bacteria. It caused methylation issues, the fat deficiency, the stuff I mentioned. And then some of those brains they looked at because it's research. Those brains looked exactly like the brains that were being looked at from humans who were diagnosed with autism, lifelong brain inflammation. That as if that wasn't incredible enough, he then took the complex carbohydrates out of the diet of these animals and the brain started to prepare themselves. The guy blows my mind. He's incredible. 15 years, he's shown the diet will transform the lives of people with autism. Uh, I don't know about Dr. Martha Herbert, but I do know that David Perlmutter's book uses a lot of Derek McFabe's research. So this is a, a huge reinforcement of how important the diet is. And then keep in mind that the good bugs in our gut they eat fruit, they eat vegetables, they need fat, like things from nuts and seeds and yolk in our eggs. We need protein, we need actual food for our brain and our bodies to function. Um, so if you want to feed the good bugs, you have to feed them the good food. If you, if you give kids carbohydrates and sugar and dairy, you will feed the bad bugs and whoever you feed is in charge. So whoever's in charge of the gut is in charge of the brain. And so I say this a fair amount. If you feed the bad bugs, they'll stay. If you starve them, they're going to go. And, and some of you may have heard of Nemchek. That's Derek McFabe's research. That Derek McFabe was the one who figured out the inulin aspect of feeding the good bugs in the gut. But, and I don't, you know, if Nemchek sees it, maybe word to the wise, it, the grains are the ones that have to be removed. So you starve the bad bugs. So what Nemchek does is it puts the inulin in, feeds the good bugs, doesn't starve the bad bugs. And there's no mention of B12. So what Dr. McFabe did was so, so like, like comprehensive that it included methylation, fat, microbiome. And, and so we can use that information. And I do every single day to help kids get better. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. But the, the first thing is identifying is that your children don't like these foods. They're addicted to them and they're causing problems every time they eat them. Um, just circling back to the first question, um, how is B12 ad administered? Well, I was going to grab a little needle. I don't know if, I don't want to, uh, do you want me to grab it quickly? And show sure, them? yeah, that's fine. Or I can okay, grab one. <laughs> okay, I'll be here one sec. <laughs> I'm sure we've got one in the cupboard. <laughs> so um, just while we're waiting for Dr. Um, Dr. Doherty to come back, um, we actually did do B12 injections. It's just a little tiny um, insulin needle, little tiny injection. And what we did was we gave it to him in his bump <laughs> at nighttime when he was sleeping. So he, he would stir just for a second and go straight back to sleep. Uh, and we did that for years, um, every single night. And um, the, the change in our son's speech was, well, he was nonverbal uh, and now he's not, <laughs> it's not perfect but um, his expressive language is exceptional now. So I can tell you uh, compared to what we had, big difference. And this is the little B12 injection. It's you know very tiny, it's an insulin syringe, it's very thin. What's in here is B12, it's water soluble and non-toxic. It is one of the most important methyl donors. It's not the only one. You also can, like this is beets. These are beet crystals. This is a methyl donor. So you can feed your kids beets. You can do something like this. You can use dimethylglycine, which is a methyl donor. Protein ends up being a methyl donor, right? That's not, you guys saw me drinking water. That's not red wine yet. Um, <laughs> but, you know, onions are methyl donors. Garlics are, garlic is methyl donors. There's this really, really neat study they did on uh, animals and it had to do with diabetes. And they actually had uh, animals who were at risk for diabetes from a genetic standpoint, they fed them a diet high in methyl donors and they didn't develop diabetes, even though they were genetically predisposed. I'll try and find the name of it. They have a really funny name. They're like these special um, 
I think they're rats that they they genetically created the risk for diabetes. So, okay, lots of questions on methyl B12 here. So, um, yeah, and that's something else to be specific about. We're saying B12, but it's actually methyl B12, um, right? And the, the, yeah. Dr. Sonia, I'll let yeah. you correct that. But they're asking how much time to give methyl B12 injections and how many years tr is treatment like? What's that look like? So um, I trained with MAPS and they have always said, try it for four to five weeks. Dr. Buckley, who's one of my heroes and my mentor, she mm -hmm. said, do it with the, the grain-free, dairy-free diet. You're going to really enhance your success. If a child's a responder in that four to five weeks, the recommendation is they continue for 18 to 24 months, but it can be stopped at any time. There's no danger. There's no rebound problems. You just stop it. But you know, if you do it for say four weeks and a child showing improvements and you stop, those improvements will probably go away. But if you do it for six months or eight months, you'll keep those improvements. You may just find newer improvements aren't as easy to come, but it's uh, it's quite obvious if it's working. I mean, people don't sneak in and inject kids or hold their kids to inject them unless it's working. Um, and that's why I really recommend doing it with the diet because otherwise you're, you're struggling with the diet, you're struggling with the injections, you're not really getting any big wows. And it's a lot of time and energy and effort. Uh, if you want the answer, do the diet and the B12 together, like magic. Any other questions before we sign off for tonight? We're going to meet back again um, next week at eight o'clock. You'll get the uh, you'll get the um, the link again on email and by text message. Uh, one more question, Dr. Sonia, uh, regarding the immune system occupying most of the brain. Are there immune markers that are typically different in autistic children compared to the general population? Not yet. I mean, I think they're still in research with that, the brain inflammation they find, and not again, not to be gruesome, they're finding it when they're examining brain tissue. Mm -hmm. But there's no downstream biomarkers that are definitive. Yeah. Okay. On that note, uh, I guess we'll sign off for tonight and then we'll see everyone back next week. Uh, did everyone find this helpful? Like, is this some, it, it, is it, are you feeling like this is going to be good for you? You're going to come back and get more information? Like, it, or, or I just want to make sure because there's so many different things that Dr. Sonia could talk about. Um, it, it's, it's like she could just talk about it in so many different ways. <laughs> and I just feel like this, this one it, it's specific to our kiddos is, um, is a big one. Um, which is why I wanted her to talk specifically this way tonight. Um, but if there's something else, by all means, uh, throw it out. Uh, throw it out there. Uh, oh, if we cut grains out, um, are there other nutrients we need to worry about supplementing, especially with multiple other allergies and sensitivities? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at your question. I just find it ironic because my 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 son had four pages of allergies and he's allergic to wheat and corn. <laughs> so go ahead, Dr. Sonia. Yeah. I mean, if they're, if they're, if they're food anaphylactic allergies, then obviously don't go near them. But something to keep in mind is that when glutamate has taken over, you know, the brain and the body, you're going to get a lot of food IgG allergies that are non, not really accurate. Um, the example I give is for like lots of women say before their menstrual cycle, they, they, they don't feel themselves, right? They might be, they might be more emotional. They might be more angry. They might be more irritable. That's a physiological change. If a child has tons of glutamate, they're going to be mad at a lot of foods that they're not necessarily going to be mad at once the glutamate is down. So the grain-free dairy-free diet takes care of a lot of these IgG. So those are delayed allergies, not anaphylactic. If your child's anaphylactic, you can't. And then, yeah, if you're taking out grains and you're putting in b12 at some point you're gonna have to be making sure kids are getting enough b6 mm -hmm. and that can you can get that through diet or you know you might have to supplement it but that's also one of the vitamins that has been really shown to improve uh, particularly behaviors in autism okay um where can the resources be found that were presented tonight well robin i'm going to send you a list okay. um and then there are many of them on here Yeah, tree dot, tree dot .ca. So just this is my website. It's it's a labor of love. It's been up for many, many years. And then this is where I have some of my favorite resources. Okay. And anything um, specific that you're not able to find, I'm sure we can hunt it down. 
And I think there was one more question. We'll squeeze it in quick uh, just before we end the night. Is B12 injection the first treatment you offer before anything else? I love the grain-free, dairy-free diet with B12 because mm -hmm. parents start seeing results in a shorter time period, like four to five weeks. Most of our parents have been through trying all kinds of different things, hearing things that could work, you know, putting full effort out. And it's just really nice to get results in a shorter period of time. So, you know, it's worth your effort. Um, so I prefer to start that way, but other autism docs maybe don't. Yeah. I think we were about eight weeks, um, before we started. And then, but when we saw it, it was like somebody lifted a veil off of our son. Like all of a sudden, bang, there he was. He went from this to all of a sudden, there he was. He was a human being in front of us, recognizing us, interacting with us. Like it was, it was very um, powerful. But now, of course, you know, not every child is going to be the same. That was our exper experience. And it was, a, it was a very powerful one, but for sure. A, a lot of kids will see nice gains though, because their B12 is low in the brain. So mm -hmm. this, this is that study. And, it, you know, again, to speak to your question, why aren't you hearing this from your doctors? This is a 2016 study. And this is not that long ago. So, but I'm excited if you guys have questions that you want or topics, certainly let Robin know. Um, and we'll get back on next week and chat some more. For sure. So if you've got questions, you can send them to info at autismunplugged.ca. I'll just drop that in the chat. And uh, we will sign off for the night and uh, we'll see you back here uh, next week, same night, 8 p.m. And like I said, I'll send out the link. Dr. Sonia, thank you so much. Oh, I'll thank get you, you to uh, stop the recording and, and the, pro and, and the, uh, the broadcast.